These are the covers of my novel Succession, the hardback, the paperback and the American edition in the middle. It's the first of a trilogy about the Wars of the Roses and specifically about Margaret Beaufort. Margaret Beaufort was the mother of Henry VII and of the Tudor dynasty. She is the ancestress of all the kings and queens since then, including our own queen. She comes down to us through history as a somewhat ambivalent figure and doesn't always get good press, particularly in novels, but I find her story fascinating. This is the Beaufort family tree. It begins with John of Gaunt, who was the third son of Edward III and the first to outlive his father. You can see that the Beauforts came from his third marriage to Catherine Swinford. In fact, they came from his affair with her before they married. They'd been having an affair for 25 years before John of Gaunt married Catherine, and the oldest son, John, at least, may have been the result of a double adultery, i.e. born when both parents were married to someone else. The Beaufort surname came from a property owned by John of Gaunt in France. When John and Catherine finally married, Richard II issued a document legitimising the Beaufort children. Henry IV confirmed this document but added a coda, excepta dignitate regalis, debarring them from the succession to the throne. All the Beaufort children went on to become significant and powerful figures and you can see that Margaret Beaufort was descended from the eldest son. His eldest son, John, sorry, his eldest son, Henry, died young, and Margaret's father, also called John, became the heir to the title Earl of Somerset. As a relative of Henry VI, he was sent to France to serve in the Hundred Years' War. This was his second bout of service, and he didn't want to go, having already spent half his life imprisoned there as a result of the Hundred Years' War the longest time in captivity of any English nobleman. You'll notice that his title here is Duke, but the dukedom was part of the price he negotiated for going. However, his campaign in France was disastrous. He returned home to face charges of incompetence, fraud and treason. He is said by one chronicle source to have committed suicide on May 27th, 1444, four days before Margaret's first birthday. Margaret was his only child, though her mother had children from an earlier marriage. She was made a ward of the Duke of Suffolk, who arranged her first marriage to his only son, John de la Pole, when she was six years old. You can see from the chart that Margaret was married four times in all, three of them before she was 15. The Duke of Suffolk was impeached for treason, then murdered, and King Henry VI found it expedient to dissolve this early marriage and marry her to his half-brother, Edmund Tudor. This was by the time she was 12, and sometime before she was 13, she became pregnant with her own child. This is Henry Tudor, her son. Henry's father, Edmund Tudor, was half-brother to the king because of another romantic medieval love story. In 1420, Henry V married Catherine de Valois as part of his bid to become King of France. Catherine was the youngest daughter of Charles VI of France. She gave birth to Henry VI in 1421, but in 1422, Henry V died in France of dysentery. Some years later, Catherine fell in love with Owen Tudor, a Welshman who is usually described as being her steward. It is said that they married in secret and had four or five children. When Catherine died, however, the King's Council pursued Owen. It is clear she was not supposed to marry either a commoner or a Welshman, and they threw him into Newgate Jail from where he escaped after hurting sore his keeper. The Council never recognised the legitimacy of the marriage or the children. Henry VI ultimately rescued Owen and took the two eldest sons, Edmund and Jasper, to his court and made them earls. They became his representatives in Wales, and Edmund died there in 1456 when Margaret was six months pregnant. 
He had been taken prisoner at Carmarthen Castle by the Duke of York's forces led by William Herbert and he died there of plague. Margaret was 13 years old and she gave birth in Pembroke Castle which belonged to Jasper Tudor on January the 28th 1457 when she was still 13. It was said that the labour was long and difficult. Margaret was tiny and both mother and son nearly died. Certainly, she never conceived again in either of her two remaining marriages. So you can see that Henry Tudor's background was complicated by illegitimacy, imprisonment, suicide. He has been described as being England's unlikeliest king. And the precariousness of his story always strikes me. If he hadn't survived, for instance, how different would England's history be? Margaret Beaufort lived through the troubled period of England's history now known as the Wars of the Roses, but it was originally known as the Cousins Wars or the Wars between the Houses of Lancaster and York. The image you see here on the left is of Henry VI and his cousin Richard Duke of York is on the right. Both were descended from Edward III. Henry VI was a troubled king, described either as saintly or mad. He wasn't warrior-like like his father. During his reign, we lost all the territory in France that Henry V had gained. Henry VI married a French princess, Margaret of Anjou, who came with virtually no dowry and was wildly unpopular, especially when she failed to conceive for the first eight years. By contrast, Richard of York was a capable leader and father of a burgeoning family. His sons included Edward, who would become Edward IV, and Richard, who would become Richard III. In 1453, Henry VI, Henry VI suffered an episode of madness, or catatonia, that lasted 16 months. England was without a king, and when his son was born, he was incapable of recognising him. The king's council turned to Richard of York, who became protector of the realm. But when the king recovered, the civil wars between Lancaster and York began. This first novel, Succession, goes up to the Battle of Toton in 1461, near York, which is still known as the bloodiest battle ever fought on British soil. It is said that when it was over, the bodies of the dead covered the nine miles or so between Toton and York. Henry VI was defeated in this battle. He and his queen went into exile, and Edward of York became king. His father, Richard of York, had been killed at the Battle of Wakefield a few weeks before. just wanted to say something about why I became interested in this period and in Margaret Beaufort. In 2007 I had finished working on a novel for young adults called The Angel Stone which is essentially about John Dee, Elizabeth I's conjurer or magician, who was warden of Manchester Cathedral towards the end of his life. The Angel Stone, pictured here, is an actual stone in the cathedral said to be the oldest carved stone in Manchester. It's of Anglo-Saxon origin. While writing The Angel Stone, I became interested in some of the other carvings in the cathedral, notably the 14 angels in the roof of the cathedral who are each playing a different medieval instrument. Here is a picture of one of them. I read that these angels were probably donated by Margaret Beaufort and at the time I had no idea who this was. The whole project has taken me nine years and now it seems impossible that I should ever have not known who she was. However, she is hardly a household name and yet she played such an important role in history. The more I found out about her, the more fascinated I became. I was very lucky in that I could work here at the Cheatham's Library in Manchester, which is England's first lending library. It was built in the 15th century in the same era I was researching. There are many links between this library and Ma Margaret Beaufort and her fourth husband, Thomas Stanley. The room I worked in, pictured on the right, was originally John Dee's bedroom. It also contains a window seat where Karl Marx and Frederick Engels used to meet. Also, the library contains many sources from the period and original documents, the letters of Henry VI and Margaret of Anjou and some of the medieval I became completely fascinated by the chronicles when I was writing this novel. 
They are such vivid and personal accounts of the time. This, for instance, is an extract of William Gregory's chronicle. Gregory, a skinner from London, was caught up in at least two of the battles of the Wars of the Roses and was an eyewitness of several key events. Here, he is describing the death of Owen Tudor, Henry Tudor's grandfather, who was executed after the Battle of Mortimer's Cross in February 1461. Also, Edward, Earl of March, the Duke of York's son and heir, had a great battle at Mortimer's Cross in Wales on the second day of February, and there he took and slew 3,000 knights and squires, and over him men say there were three suns shining. In that battle, Owen Tudor was taken and brought to Hereford East and was beheaded in the marketplace and his head set upon the market cross. And a madwoman combed his hair and washed the blood from his face and she got candles and set more than a hundred of them around him burning. You see what I mean? I love this story. It's so vivid. I had to include it in my novel. In the end, I used extracts from several chronicles in all three of the novels, weaving them into the chapters in my narration, because nothing else conveys so vividly the spirit and voice of the time. So Succession deals with several characters, but through it all I keep returning to Margaret, my main heroine, who was so deeply affected by the wars. She lost two fathers-in-law in the battles, several cousins, and after the Battle of Toton, her son, because Edward IV decided to reward his general, William Herbert, with custody of Henry Tudor. So Henry grew up in the household of the man responsible for the death of his father. So Margaret, this was beginning of 24 years of negotiation and strategy as she attempted to regain custody of her only child. Her stories continued in the second novel of the trilogy, Rebellion.